by the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Baker, and the Iraqi ambassador, Mr. Tariq Aziz. I know that the eyes of the world were on that conference and on that press conference because everyone was hoping to hear that a settlement had been reached that would avoid war. Mr. Baker explained, first of all, the American position and the position of the United Nations as they had made their resolutions and the disappointment that he had, that he felt, because he had seen in his conference with Mr. Aziz no progress in any settlement in persuading Iraq to leave Kuwait peacefully. Also, he said that force could be used after January 15th to enforce the resolutions of the United Nations that Iraq leave Kuwait. For his part, Mr. Aziz declared that Iraq would not leave Kuwait under UN or US pressure. And in the question and answer period that followed his remarks, and to me this was very significant, he was asked whether Iraq would attack Israel if a war broke out. Maybe some of you heard him say with great firmness that Iraq would certainly attack Israel. He left no, no doubt in the minds of his hearers that Israel would be a prime target in the case of war. Of course, since that conference was held, the United States Congress has voted, as you know, to allow the president to go ahead and use force after January 15th, Tuesday of this week. That is the latest development that I know of. Ever since 1947, when the United Nations voted to partition Palestine, giving part of it to the Jews for a Jewish state, and part of it to the Arabs for a Palestinian state, there has been implacable resistance on the part of the Arabs toward the very existence of the state of Israel. They have declared many, many times that it is their intention to destroy the state of Israel and to kill or expel the Jews from that land. After Israel became a nation in 1948, immediately she was attacked by her Arab neighbors with the idea that they would destroy the nation at its birth, if possible. Actually, the land that Israel occupied at the time of the United Nations partition was the land that they had bought as settlers brought from the Arabs over a period of several generations, starting in the, in the 1800s. They were living in that land. It was land that the, many of the Arab owners had felt was useless, and they sold it for high prices and were glad to get the money. And the Jews lived there and settled that area. Under Turkish rule, you remember that Turkey ruled Palestine, indeed much of the Arab world, until World War I. Just a little review of our history to help us understand the background. After World War I, the British were given a mandate to rule Palestine, to keep the peace. It was not a British possession, but simply a British responsibility. The Jews continued to return there and to buy up property. And there were definite areas where the Jews lived 
There were definite areas where the Arabs lived. And so when the United Nations voted to partition Palestine, they gave those areas where the Jews lived, which they had purchased primarily for them to live in. And they accepted that, even though if you've ever seen a map of Israel or of that land as it was divided by the United Nations, you would see that the territories allotted to Israel were very, very sketchy indeed and were hardly able to be a viable state. And yet Israel said, we'll accept that. The Arabs wouldn't even let them have that. They were unwilling that they should have the land that they had bought, lived on, and developed. And so they were attacked immediately. Since that time, since that first war, they have been attacked several more times and had to fight for their existence, for their very life. Saddam Hussein, Iraq's leader, has been made no secret of his intention to destroy Israel. And he's been able to obtain a vast following among the Arab peoples because of that, even outside of Iraq. This is one of the things that's worrying the Saudi leaders and some of the other Arab leaders, because even though they are not for Israel, they feel that Saddam Hussein appears as a hero to the Arabs in general because he promises to fulfill their desire to destroy Israel. So this is causing much of the problem in the, and the crisis over there right now. On the other hand, the United States has promised in the event of attack on Israel to defend Israel, which puts this nation in a very strange position. Being allied with the Saudis and other Arab nations and yet also being allied with Israel, their enemy as they see it which a very unpleasant and uncomfortable position, to, as you can imagine, to be in. There are those among the Arabs who see Saddam as the one who will, quote, solve the Jewish problem, as they see it. And when we hear that expression, my mind automatically goes back, back to Eichmann, and Hitler, who decided that the way to solve the Jewish problem, as they saw it, was the ovens and the concentration camps and the eradication of an entire nation of people, the Jewish people. And out of that came the Holocaust and the destruction of six million people, at least, simply because they were Jews and coined a new word in our dictionary, in our vocabulary, genocide, which means the destruction of an entire race. This was Hitler's aim. This almost seems to be the aim of the Arabs, and certainly is the aim of Saddam Hussein, from all that he has said. All of these recent happenings, and we are on the threshold of the ultimatum day, so to speak, the 15th, should remind us as Bible believers that we may be getting very near the days that prophecy has told us about, and that these things can very well be signs of the times for us as we look at what is happening. God had warned Israel long ago, long before this time, and long before their, their exile, what was going to happen to them. Well, I'd like to take a, just a review look at that for a few moments before we go on. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, in the 58th verse, Moses told them, through, by God's Spirit and his word, 
told Israel, he said, if you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, I'm reading from verse 58, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants, harsh and prolonged disasters and severe and lingering illnesses. He will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt that you dreaded, and they will cling to you. The Lord will also bring on you every kind of sickness and disaster not recorded in this book of the law until you are destroyed. You who are as numerous as the stars in the sky will be left but few in number because you did not obey the Lord your God. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in number, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. You will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations, from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Among those nations you will find no repose, no resting place for the sole of your feet. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing, and a despairing heart. And he goes on in the same vein to describe the anguish and the sorrow and the troubles and the sufferings of the Jewish people. History bears witness that God's word has been fulfilled. These things, in fact, have happened to the letter to the Jewish people. Books have been written called The Wandering Jew. They have wandered from nation to nation, seeking refuge, seeking rest, seeking security, and never really finding very much. Even in this nation, where they have found the most of all, they have suffered, in many cases, a great deal of intolerance, prejudice, anti-Semitism. In fact, it was in this country itself that they organized an, an organization called B'nai B'rith, which was intended to shield them from some of the obvious prejudice and persecution that they had simply for being Jews. <clears throat> this prophecy that I've just read was ultimately fulfilled in the year 70 of this era, about 2,000 years ago, when the Romans finally destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the Jewish commonwealth, scattered the Jews throughout the empire, from which many of them even took refuge outside the empire, as far away as China and other lands in the Orient. From that time to this, till modern times, they have had no nation, no place to live as a people once of their, of their own, until, as you know, our own day. <clears throat> in the 30th chapter of this book, beginning in the first verse, God tells them, when all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. Here we have a promise 
that God would someday take pity on his nation, his people, that he would bring them back to their land, that he would multiply them exceedingly, make them prosperous, make them strong. And the implication is that there will be a great change at that time in Israel's outlook spiritually because he says the Lord will, verse 6, will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. He's going to change their hearts, their outlook, their attitude. And as we read in Zechariah 12, in our scripture reading, he says, they will look on me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son. And they'll be in bitterness for him. They'll be sorry that they rejected God's son someday. They'll realize what they did. In the 11th chapter of Isaiah, <clears throat> verses 10 through 12, we have a, another prophecy of this time. And there are many more, but we just are going to look at a very few samplings. He's talking about the day when the kingdom will be set up in the context. And he says, in that day, the root of Jesse, and that's a, a poetic name of Jesus, or title for Jesus, the Messiah, will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, that's Iraq, by the way, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, that's Persia, from Babylonia, from Hamath, from the islands of the sea. God is going to bring them back, he says, to their land. And then he goes on to say he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Now that is not yet completely fulfilled, obviously. There are still very many Jewish people in this country and very many in Russia, in the Soviet Union. Some of them are now leaving the Soviet Union and a great many have been allowed to leave in the last year or so and are emigrating to Israel. Israel right now is having a crisis of sorts to supply housing and work for all these new immigrants from Russia to their land. So this, among other prophecies in the Old Testament, foretell not only the scattering, but the regathering of Israel. In the 43rd chapter of this prophet Isaiah, we read, Now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And then skipping down to verse 5, he says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So he mentions north, south, east, and west. God will bring them back from the four quarters of the earth. Jesus himself, our Savior, as he looked ahead with the eye of prophecy that he had, also foretold that regathering. In the 21st chapter of Luke, in the 20th verse, First of all, he describes the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which was yet 40 years future when he uttered the prophecy. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. 
and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Some of those things I read earlier that Moses and Isaiah wrote about their, their being scattered. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem, in fact, has been under Gentile domination ever since that time, up until very recent times. He said that the Jews would be taken away to all the nations. That was literally fulfilled. There's no question about it. If you know your history, you know that happened. But he also said that Jerusalem would be trampled on by the Gentiles up to a certain point until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which implies that someday that situation will be brought to a close and that Israel will be restored once more to Jerusalem and to her land. The Apostle Paul also spoke of this in Romans 11, <clears throat> in verses 25 through 29. Paul is talking about the problem of why Israel did not accept Jesus and what has happened to them because of that. In verse 25, he says to these believers in Rome, he writes to them, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, of this secret, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, Israel as a nation has become hardened, part of them at least, toward the gospel, toward God says Paul in that day. There were some that believed. He himself was Jewish. But the larger part, by far the larger part, rejected the Lord. And he says that will continue until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Now, I don't know when that will be. He implies that God knows when the full number of Gentile believers have been added to the Lord, the full number that are going to accept. And when that happens, then the situation changes because he says the hardening continues until that number has come in of the Gentiles. Then he turns and says, and so all Israel will be saved after the Gentiles have come in. Then he says, Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Jacob is Israel. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. He hasn't done that yet. He's going to do it. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Now that's a very important word, irrevocable. Irrevocable means you cannot take it back. You cannot revoke what has been given. God called and chose those people long ago. He has not forgotten that call. That call is irrevocable. It will be honored by the God of heaven who cannot lie, who cannot fail his promises. And so he says there is coming a day when all those Israelites who are alive will accept, will believe. Now, there may be some that won't live to see it, obviously so. But as we go back to Zechariah, <clears throat> we noticed that 
he concluded that passage with the fact that they would look on the one they pierced, they would mourn for him, which implies their repentance. The one who comes from Zion, the one who is able to forgive their sins if they'll only believe and accept him as their Messiah, which they've been unwilling to do for 2,000 years almost. As we look at this chapter that we read, or part of which we read, in Zechariah 12, we notice some very clear facts that I think have a direct bearing on what we are seeing at this moment in the Middle East. First of all, we notice that the prophet tells us that Jerusalem, God is going to make Jerusalem a cup, a cup that sends all the surrounding nations reeling, as though they were drunk, a cup filled with intoxicating beverage that they will drink. In fact, Jeremiah uses that very figure in the 25th chapter of Jeremiah. He says God has a cup that he's going to fill, a cup of wrath, a cup of wine, as it were. And the, the nations will drink that cup, and they'll reel, they'll stagger in drunkenness from it. God is going to deal with the nations as well. Notice also he says, on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, against Israel, against Jerusalem, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. This is a figure taken from weightlifting, actually. The weightlifters of old didn't have the nice uh, things that they have now with metal rods and weights and so on. They practiced with rocks. They would lift rocks, progressively heavier rocks for their weightlifting training. They did it long ago, too. This rock called Jerusalem will be so heavy that all who try to lift it will injure themselves. Just like those who are in weight training are cautioned not to lift weights that they're not yet ready for. They've got to work up gradually to heavier and heavier weights. Otherwise, they can severely injure themselves if they lift too heavy for them. And so God is saying, Jerusalem's going to be too heavy for you to lift, but you're going to try to lift it. And in doing so, you will only injure yourselves, nations. It's hard for us to understand, in a way, how this can all be fulfilled. We think, for example, of the fact that President Bush has promised to defend Israel, and yet at the same time he is allied, or we, the United States is allied, with the Arabs, who are Israel's mortal enemies. And we wonder, as we see this picture that is given here, where it says all the nations are going to be gathered against Jerusalem, that implies the United States as well, all the UN nations, all those who formerly were friendly to Israel seem at this juncture to be her enemies. Now that hasn't yet come. We could offer some possibilities of how it can come about. As I say, if the United States stands in the very uncomfortable position of being allied both with Israel and her enemies, her mortal enemies, just a change of policy in the administration can cause a shift in which, in order to retain Arab goodwill and support, the United States would be forced, as they would look upon it, to go over against Israel, along with all the others. So that Israel stands completely isolated, completely alone, without any human help, which is precisely where God wants her to be. Because when she is without help from man, then she will learn that there is only one who can help her, and that is her God. 
and her Messiah. And that's when she'll call out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Then she will know, then Israel will know, that the hand of man cannot help. Put not your trust in princes, said David, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Put not your trust in princes. We as believers too have that same temptation. We might trust our administration's foreign policy. We might do that. And certainly we owe respect to our leaders. We must respect them. But we do, it does not say that we have to fight in their wars or that we have to support their wars. The Bible tells us that that last war is going to be a war against God, against God's people. And I would not want to be fighting found fighting against God or his people, Israel. <clears throat> the nations in their usual style will attempt to solve the problem by war. Now whether they will do that this week or this month or this year, I, I cannot tell you. I'm not a prophet. But anyone who reads these prophecies and takes them seriously has got to understand that what is happening in the world at this very moment could very well be the stage upon which these, this final drama will be enacted. In the 14th chapter, he says, a day of the Lord is coming when your plunder, he's talking to Jerusalem, your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured the houses ransacked, the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. We had already read in chapter 12 that Israel would be, or that Jude Jerusalem would be kept intact. In verse 6, he says that Israel will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. So Jerusalem, despite all the nations of the world against it, in the end, will not be destroyed. Because at that juncture, remember chapter 14, verse 3, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. God will come to the rescue of his people in that day. His word is true. His word has not failed up to this time. There is no reason to think it should ever fail. God cannot and will not lie. The prophet Daniel, one of the very important books of the Old Testament, in the ninth chapter of his prophecy, in the 26th verse, he's speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the cutting off of the Messiah. He says, after the 62 sevens, and is talking about the 70 weeks of, of Daniel, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut off, will have nothing. We all know that happened to him. He did not get what was promised to him, that he should rule the world. It was not given to him then. Remember the parable Jesus told that the nobleman must go away to the far country, to heaven itself, and to return, having received the kingdom. So he was cut off without receiving the kingdom at that time. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, precisely what Rome did to that city after Jesus' time on the earth. And then he says something very interesting. He says, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. And desolations have been decreed. The United Nations was formed to avoid wars, a very worthy and noble aim. Sincere on the part of many, I'm sure. 
And yet the Bible says, wars will continue until the end. Jesus had said, or later said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. The end is not yet. When the end comes, there won't be wars and rumors of wars. Right now, we have wars and rumors of wars. The biggest rumor right now is regarding Tuesday, midnight, isn't it? What's going to happen then? The end is not yet here, my dear friends and, and beloved brothers and sisters, but it could be very near. It could be very near. And I cannot tell you whether the outbreak of war, if there is one, between the UN forces and Iraq will develop into the final war of the age. It might. It could easily. If that war breaks out that is threatened right now, that could certainly quickly be funneled into Israel, to Jerusalem, as Saddam Hussein plans and intends to do and has promised to do. Then what would happen? You can certainly see how it could happen. On the other hand, if there is a war, it could be followed by a period again of troubled peace, like the so-called Cold War was, where there was no overt war between the United States and the, the, uh, the communist powers, but there was a troubled period of a whole generation when the nations were building up their nuclear stockpiles. Nobody knew whether the atomic bombs would be unleashed and the intercontinental ballistic missiles. Nobody knew. What we need to do at this present time is suggested, I think, by Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9. He says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Make that part of your daily prayers because you're praying then for the kingdom. You're praying for the coming of the king. You're praying for God's will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. I think we should pray that war will not break out, at least at this time, but pray at least most of all for the peace of Jerusalem so that those things which the prophets have foretold may come to pass ultimately. I'd like to read from the prophet Micah. We don't very often read from his book. The fourth chapter of Micah, the first four verses. And this same prophecy is found in Isaiah 2, practically word for word. And I usually read it, excuse me, from Isaiah, but I'm going to read it from Micah because of just giving you a little more acquaintance with this book. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he will judge between many peoples. He will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken." Now that is God's promise. God himself has spoken and he will make it true. But meanwhile, it is up to us to pray 
for the peace of Jerusalem. It is up to us to live each day for the Lord, doing those things that the Lord has asked us to do, living the way that he's asked us to live, showing the love that he's asked us to show, the patience, the zeal for his word, the desire to learn his word, the desire for fellowship with his people, so that as the writer of Hebrews says, we may spur one another on to love and to good deeds and not neglect our assembling together to encourage one another in these troublous times. And he concludes that by saying, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We see the day approaching. We can see it better than anyone ever did before because we're closer to it. And every day that passes brings us closer to that day. And so Jesus warned us and also encouraged us as we read in Luke 21, and I want to close with his words, the 21st chapter, the 28th verse. He says, when these things, and he was describing the final windup of things, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. When we see these things that not only taking place, but beginning to take place, whatever is going to happen yet in this age, at least we are seeing the beginning. I would submit that. The stage is being set. We are seeing the beginning at least of all of this. And Jesus says, when you see the beginning of these things, then he says, stand up and lift up your heads, implying our welcoming of the Lord, our ready, getting ready for the Lord. The physical body language of showing expectancy, desire, longing, readiness, preparation, all of those things for the Lord's coming because we believe with all our hearts that the Lord's day of return is drawing <clears throat> very near and that we, every one of us, need to be ready for that day. Amen.